Namaste and welcome back to our continuing series Evenings with Shadalo. Namaste. Namaste. Happy to be with all of you. We are happy to continue today Evenings with Shadalo part 173 on the current affairs. Today part 3 and we will be taking some more que- some more questions that we received. And first, I will uh, repeat the last question that we answered from Sumana. And Shadalu will shed more light on this uh, letter. After a small pause after 2020, it looks like the Asuric forces behind world powers are again gearing up for imposing another series of mandates, restrictions in movements, etc. in the name of another virus variant or climate change, etc. Although I understand that the extreme circumstances in 2020 have awakened many people and many hidden things have become preeminent, it still feels like This is one-sided battle and the Asuric force is enormous compared to our power. Apart from trying to raise our consciousness, trying to make others conscious, what else can we do to combat this huge power? How is the divine power going to help us? Is there any guidance from Sri Aurobindo and the mother which we can relate to the present day situation Yes, Um, we had taken this question last time and the question was only partly answered and I had promised to build upon what we discussed last time and develop it further. Last time you will recall we looked at the nature of the crisis from consciousness perspective, mother's warnings, guidance and something which was very critical uh, to my understanding when she said that the divine, she cannot promise that the divine will find this present human civilization worth saving. And Sri Aurobindo's comment that it's not the civilization that has to be saved, it's the world that has to be saved. And the question was, she said, still in the balance. The elaboration of Sri Aurobindo on this, he says, uh, it is the world that has to be saved and that will surely be done, though it may not be so easily or so soon as some wish or imagine or in the way that they imagine. The present civilization must surely change but whether by a destruction or a new construction on the basis of a greater truth is the issue. So we have before us these two possibilities. One is a great destruction by which that which has to go will go. The other is that some greater truth is perceived received by humanity and on the basis of this a new civilization is built up. So at least as far as we are concerned today we should consider that both of these things are happening at the same time. All that which refuses to change breaks down by crashing circumstances. All that looks to and opens to the newer higher possibilities and the new consciousness and the new world well begins to build around individuals, collectives, units, communities, institutions, something of the new civilization on the basis of a deeper or greater truth. (coughs) Now with this in the background I had said we need to look at why and how this situation came to be. What is it that has as if blocked that higher truth or brought us to this impasse? On a very general level we might say that it is an evolutionary crisis so human evolution has risen to the maximum that it could with the mind. It reaches a certain peak beyond that the mind cannot go. Things which mind built up will break down and something moves on to higher levels. But it's not so simple. Paralleling this human evolution is also a different power which wants to prevent and delay and confuse even harm human evolution which works at the same time as the evolutionary possibilities build, it at each step uses those possibilities to try to divert the very potential of the evolution. And this is a game that goes very, very far back. 
and i want to put this in context with something very interesting which took place in the year 2011 i met with llewellyn von lee he is a sufi teacher based in the united states a disciple of uh, mrs irina tweedy it's a lineage naqshbandi lineage and i've mentioned him many times in our discussions here uh, one of the very few among the modern spiritual teachers contemporary spiritual teachers that you can actually look up to as an example of a great purity and transparency of inspiration and purpose so in 2011 when i had occasion to meet him it was quite a surprise ah yes at least <laughs> there are people like this and one of the first things he shared with me was an experience he had had which he had just written about in 2010 which was titled the wall it's a long article in which he describes his experience that in his states in the inner worlds um, outside the body outside the material world let's say uh, he enters this world of light and on this side from this side approaching the world of light he finds a wall smooth made of bricks and he distinguishes this from what is normally present which is layers of consciousness veils so to say by which the light limits itself so that we might not be too overwhelmed and so the whole evolution spiritual evolution involves the veils shedding bit by bit so that we also adapt and evolve with the increasing light but this was not veils of that the light has put it is brick walls that human beings have put very smooth very neat and once he found a crack and immediately the forces of darkness rushed to cover the crack and rebuild the wall where there was a crack and so the whole article is quite fascinating i have put the link for it in the description of today's video session and those of you who are interested can look at it uh, subsequently it was removed from his website it's part of a book which he sells but i found the online archive.org has saved that so i've put that link here the end point of his whole discussion was he saw this a special light emerging from the year 2000 which could have made a breakthrough for humanity at some point a few years down humanity basically ignored it it shrank withdrew and then he said in 2011 the light has gone out now that thing which was given for helping human evolution well it's not there anymore of course the light is not gone away it's just that its active presence in the earth as a support to earth evolution has gone out uh, the point though was this wall and he asked me is there something in shri urbindo's or mother's uh, tradition description which corresponds to what he saw because one of the things he saw was this wall has been there for a very long time and it's been built up by human beings for so long that people have even forgotten what it's like to have the light nourish them and the lack of that light is what creates in humanity this utter sense of loss and dryness and forgetfulness of the deeper purpose that perhaps the last time uh, the light was revealed or freely flowing was in the previous let's say golden age so i found at the time i don't remember what i was able to convey but um, for today's discussion at, at least i found this observation of the mother which uh, is a message that she gave for the new year of 1961 and the message goes thus this wonderful world of delight waiting at our gates for our call to come down upon earth and then there are three dots as if there is more to be said but much that is left unsaid and so there were naturally a few comments uh, questions from people and one of her commentaries on this was this world of delight above us is waiting not for us to be ready but for us to accept for us to condescend to receive it that is what i am looking at in this photograph in fact that is what i am pulling down so that was the photo given in that with that message of the new year so it's not something which we need to be ready for to receive it's a consciousness that can come as it as we are even but for us to condescend to receive that is we are so busy in our life and uh, warped values that we don't even ask for it 
and she distinguished this from the supramental consciousness. Um, and so somebody asked, how can one effectively call this wonderful world of delight? Mother's answer simply, an absolute sincerity in the aspiration. She did not elaborate much on this. Uh, she only said it is, not, uh, it is not the world of delight that has come down in the supramental 1956, but only the supramental light, consciousness and force. This is something different. Many questions were asked to which she gave very brief, curt answers, long questions followed by two-line response and so on. So one of the questions was asked, uh, what is this world, how long has it been waiting, something like that. And she answers, it has always been waiting since the beginning of the creation. And that's it. She doesn't say much more. Now, I do not know if this corresponds exactly with Llewellyn's experience, whether it's the same thing, but it's the closest match that I could find. And the main focus for me was this, and it's the question he had raised at that point. How did this wall get built? Who built it and how? And is it possible for us to dismantle it? It was clear, he writes in the article, that the light from the other side can just choose to dissolve it. But it's from our side that we have built it, so the light also perhaps waits for us to choose. But how was it built? What is it built of? And he gives a few hints there, but leaves the la answers largely open. He says it's the human conceptions, ideas, um, beliefs. It's built from those things. Now, I want to elaborate on this and in the sense of how this wall has come, come to be. And for this, we have to go back quite far back. Consider a time in human evolution where you have reasonably isolated kingdoms, tribes, communities, etc. And a consciousness which is not sufficiently evolved, in the mass at least, to be able to directly relate to or even aspire for the higher spiritual possibility. And its primary drives are still largely animal, because we are, as you know, more than half animal, the rest being partly human. And so those drives predominating, the animal instincts of domination, control, possession, etc. All these things being there, driven by desire, typically petty, personal, narrow interests, fears, and so on, some of which we discussed last time from one of Mother's messages. And with that, let's say a powerful person now wants to create around him a domain of his control. What do you do? You begin to impose your power, and when somebody opposes the power, you suppress. If they continue to oppose or if they are too strong, then there is a collision of power centers and either they separate and they become two separate power centers, which eventually will still collide, or eventually one of them su is subjugated by the other or eliminated by the other. And this pattern you will see all through history. This is still at a very human level. Behind this, we have to consider the forces which will also play through the human beings. And it's not so much a human being which wants to possess, which of course is there, but the powers behind which want to possess the human beings themselves. And the best way to possess human beings directly is to possess the people who possess them. So the moment a person rises like this, of a reasonably strong control center, those powers which want to control human beings will tend to align with this person and begin to infiltrate their thoughts, their emotions, their drives, their passions. And as long as they live by their passions and instincts, it's very easy to infiltrate. But the perspective of those powers and the perspective of the human being is slightly different. For the human being, as long as I live, when I'm not there, it doesn't matter what happens. So even people will say, if I have to die, I don't mind if I have to press the nuclear button as I die, because the rest doesn't matter. It's a very narrow, petty, egoistic perspective. But when that ego becomes slightly larger, it says, I may die, but I want people to remember me so that I may be immortal in their memory. So then you extend yourself, either through your own family, so your children who take your place to protect you, in a way, indirectly, it's the extended ego, or you create an institution with your name upon it, through which this is now extended. But even that is short. A couple of generations down, it means nothing. 
we don't remember we barely remember our grandparents if at all our great grandparents if you have heard anything at all you're lucky anything above that great great grandparents you probably know nothing and this is how it is so two or three generations down that has no meaning but for those beings who act through them the game is very different their consciousness is pretty much immortal some of them are on a scale which is almost cosmic at least universal and many of them have local dominions which to their sense of time a million years is nothing so when they get a grip on someone they always ensure a continuity and they have an agenda which spans across generations so they can wait you out you can say all right i refuse for the duration of your lifetime no big deal they will hold back wait until you are gone and then push hard again or find another instrument and then push hard again so their line of thinking their way of thinking the scope of time and control and influence is very different from the human if we don't understand this we will never understand the situation today this is crucial to be able to understand why the situation in humanity today is what it is and how the wall could be built so thoroughly so with such detail and precision and with a full machinery to repair any tiny crack that may appear in it so understand this that there is a program that has been going on across generations across centuries across millennia where human consciousness human memory may not survive but the powers which influence the powerful human beings the controllers of other human beings they have an agenda they have a continuity and so you observe what are their focal centers how would if you had to control power if you had to let's say if you could live if you had a life span of 10000 years not much actually and you were given a township or even a planet and you had an agenda you need to conquer this what would you do you might spend the first couple of generations of human life not much 60 70 years typically observing them observing their motivations and then what would you do you would infiltrate you would build a layer of human beings that corresponded with your values but were made of their substance and then through them begin the infiltration process you have 10000 years you can spend 2 or 300 years even 500 years building your let's say institutional control and then what would you do you would not have just one person you would build multiple points of entry at some point as you go further the multiple points would begin to collaborate with each other because now they become entrenched centers and then you will say now i have enough control that i can swing on from multiple centers and none of them know each other they're quite independent to their own consciousness and as i push this little pawn the others are aligned to assist this one and it may never know that it's being helped so now you have one entity operating behind the scenes invisible to the humans pushing motivations influences suggestions actively giving power to those who are more receptive as mediums and playing the game of pawns occasionally finding somebody with greater potential doing more harm or more control expansion and then eventually nurturing more and more people of the more greater potential or if you see somebody who seems to rise with some potential ah this one i need to catch before it goes a different direction so reach out to them while they're young if you think about it in this way the whole strategy is very simple almost childishly simple and very obvious if you were playing a game of chess in over half an hour this is what you're doing you're putting your pushing your little pieces to have a collective so to say encircling of the enemy to constrict and then own possess eliminate whatever form it is but you start with small moves and then build and align them thinking strategic strategically you learn a lesson of a mistake made 500 years ago and you see the same pattern occurring this time you have made the correction for it and you're ahead of the game you start anticipating oh if 200 years down this thing happens 
I must make my insurance policy. Put other players in place. Observe the centers of power emerging. Something which to the human mind we barely bother to do looking back the last 200 years. How much of what we are taught in history is actually a study of how things happen in this way that we could learn lessons for application today. Mostly it is names and dates and events given almost arbitrary value, but not strategic value. Now when you start thinking like this and observing like this, you see the same exact same pattern everywhere. Except that with this long term perspective, you can build entrenched centers and protect them. Going back a thousand years, not a big deal. I remember still it was uh, somebody who was in one of the lineages, uh, Christian lineages, a nun in that lineage. And she made suddenly a comment, we were discussing something. She made a comment, my lineage goes back a thousand, two hundred years. We know what it means to plan ahead. It's interesting. Her own lifetime may not be much more than a human life. We know the identity was not just the personal little ego, it was the collective ego of the institution and that had been drilled in and had possessed the individual mind. The drives of that mind now did not mind losing in the short term for the long term gain for its institution. It did not mind even if it has to die for the collective to survive and spread. Oh, 1200 years, no big deal even though you might not live to see it. So you have created in a sense through this institution or many such institutions, a kind of a collective ego, a collective individuality that can survive the individuals who come and go and change. And given enough time, you realize the one you choose as your next power center as the head of your institution might get compromised, you create a backup. If the backup gets compromised, you have a third level, again, insurance policy by which you can eliminate them. And all this you will see is petty intrigue in the lineages of any religion, any organized religion, I mean. And this you must understand, the consciousness driving it all is something much larger. Now with this background, look at what are the current focal points of power, power centers today. The single most important today, it's not even the government. The government is helpless mostly if this power center is in your control and this is media propaganda. If you control, the mass media is something relatively new. It was there before but it was not so strong, not so organized. You could spread stories, you had travelers coming from other countries and so a lot depended on gossip. The written word and more recently the internet as a medium for dissemination. You can write an article today sitting in your home and in two seconds it is available to all of humanity who is online. Just like that. This has never been before. It's barely happened in the last 30 years of which the mass of humanity has come online in the last let's say 10 or 15 years. And the power that it has given to influence but the beauty of it, unlike the prior media, which going back, let's say, 100 years, was newspaper, which was controlled by individuals. This one cannot be easily controlled. And especially in the last 10 years, because it has challenged the media control that was organized before, needs immediately to be possessed and seized. And therefore, what you find, which is quite fascinating to see, all these gigantic media companies, uh, social media companies, we will say, need to be owned by the powers that want to control humanity. And if anything inside the system starts shaking the balance too much, eliminate, remove them. So, media propaganda is today even more powerful than the government because it can put put such a huge pressure on the government by swinging the thought process of the masses. Go back a couple of steps before the internet and you had television and newspapers. Between these two, television is more powerful because it is visual, auditory and with suitable use of moving images, 
it can evoke strong emotions. And if you play the images suitably, you can swing a person's emotions and lead them to any state. Just as an example, I'm just thinking out of the blue. You're shown an image of people who have just been affected by an atom bomb explosion at a distance. You see their sickness and you know the images. And an atomic power station has just exploded, let's say, Chernobyl or Fukushima in Japan. You have images of that. And then after that you come and say, nuclear power, is this what we really want? You don't have to think. Your visceral emotional reaction is, no! It comes just like that, so intensely. It's as if identified with the substance and tissue. The word visceral is, tissue of your body is rebelling, literally. The same thing could be swing in a completely different way. You are shown images of a nuclear power station. People in these uh, white dresses, laboratory clean, controlling panels, showing efficiencies. You give a little bit of mathematics and show how much power you get for so little effort. And these nuclear stations could go on 20, 30, 40 years. And it is so easy to just entomb them and seal them away. And contrast that with a dam blocking the river, the fish dying, the local flora fauna affected, inundation of villages, people crying, saying my village is gone, my ancestral village destroyed by these nasty damn people, etc. Play on these two images and you say, what's our solution? And you'll say, yes, of course, nuclear power. It's so clean, pure. Oh yes, a little bit of radiation, but that's contained, not a big deal. We have all these scientists, the greatest minds are thinking about it. Just how you play the images, move you intens intensely and then bring something else and you start clamoring for the solution that they want you to clamor for. The way governments have played human beings or the power centers have played human beings is they will create a problem which pushes you in the direction of the solution that they want. The crisis is created in order to solve the crisis now, the media starts telling you, this is the way, this is the way, this is the way, this is the only way we must ask for this. Why aren't enough people asking? People are asleep. Our uh, humanity's survival is in danger. Our democracy is in danger. Our future, our children, show a few images of children, babies, and there you've moved emotionally. And the mass starts saying, why isn't the government moving? And at that point, a politician who plays the game either consciously or unintentionally, just says, well, I want to win the election. I promise you this. And everyone says, at last, here's someone who's thinking. No, the whole thing was set up. You were conned. This is a pattern which was used in those days, going back a few decades. Before that, you had just newspapers. The power of the newspaper was, most people stopped with the headlines. You take a long article, most people don't have time to read. They scan through the headlines. By skillfully playing the headlines, you could program a message. Observe how you were taught even to depend on the newspaper. Visualize yourself reading a newspaper. What's the image that comes naturally to your mind? Or visualize somebody you know, your parents, reading a newspaper. What's the image you, you see? sitting at breakfast, sipping a cup of tea and with a newspaper open in front of you. Turning pages. Which pages? First thing everyone looks at is the first half. Headlines. Notice the size of the letters used and the way we describe it. We will say, screaming headlines. You understand what that means? Very large, bold type. I remember one of the most dramatic we had, Indira Gandhi assassinated. It's one of those things you see once in a lifetime typically. Head of your country assassinated. Screaming, bang, bold. And the text was large, bold. And then there were smaller articles. And they filled two or three pages with just that. Just like that, overnight. I remember there was another time when a group 
it was in the based in the indian express they were trying to topple the government of rajiv gandhi on the bofors uh, corruption case the corruption case might have been genuine but what you saw in the newspaper manipulation was so blatant so obvious but effective so they had articles after articles just describing this from various points of view one uh, jet malani said that i will ask 10 questions until he resigns and keep at it for one month he did not resign but what happened was you could see how it was played every day there would be these 10 questions after a while they ran out of useful questions and then they would build so one day there'll be just a few things the next day more 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 and then there was one day when the entire newspaper had only bofors nothing else and then the next day they went zero nothing on bofors it was like a shock and again they rebuilt and again a shock and again rebuilt this is classic media manipulation to build a certain intensity but you can't sustain intensity you get exhausted and then they relax but this was crude it was immature the actual technology is far more sophisticated you have to play emotions so they will create fear they'll create anger they'll create hatred and then shame and that's when you associate that name with shame anger hatred fear so let's say the at that time it was the us government wants to topple saddam hussein sorry i'm going back to examples which were some 30 years ago but with good reason i'd rather not speak of things which are immediate because there are too many emotions associated with it so saddam hussein who is running a country in which you have freedom for women's education women drive cars freely and it's an, it's an islamic country you have open mm, freedom to practice all religions nothing at all that you can criticize it is the model state for the middle east which others are by far far less freedom of thought and now he's being toppled how ah yes he used poison gas against the kurdish go back 80 years and it was the british who used poison gas against the kurdish saddam hussein only repeated what the british did nobody spoke about that this man now is being described with various words associations of words so they would they were headlines saying butcher of baghdad b b the b repeated it's part of the programming to create the what you see as a power in uh, poetry the rhythm and rhyme is what amplifies the power in poetry and this is like a mantra when you repeat the sounds it has an effect in the mind of a repetitive power build up you will see if you go back to marvel comics i'm sorry i'm jumping around a little bit but you'll get the idea how it works look back at every superhero and you'll find this alliteration peter parker uh, i don't know but unfortunately the names don't come back but every single name you'll find has this alliteration of repetition of names mendrick the magician mum it is fascinating to study why how and it's intentionally done now butcher of baghdad and then you have these articles coming up every day amplifying building up until you have built in the collective mind a disgust or a hatred or sense of shame combination until people are saying but why are you allowing him to continue and that's when the military action begins and you say oh what a relief finally this man is removed everyone is going to be happy and the headlines stop talking about it so the people who were pushing for this now feel as if everything has become quiet because the newspaper tells you nothing now all is well if you actually go to iraq you will see the condition the pitiful condition of the people the entire economy is in shambles since he was toppled 30 years ago there's constant strife there are so many communities fighting each other uh, mafia rule gun toting uh, criminals everywhere nothing chaos and it's gone to the worst possible lowest grade of uh, rule of religious rule that you can find nobody is telling you this in the media i remember there was a meeting in india was by a group that had brought many religious uh, teachers from all over the world it was in jaipur and there were a couple of young people who had come from uh, iraq at that time this was probably 2007 2008 perhaps and so i it was more than 15 years since that us had entered into iraq 
and i asked this question in front of the whole audience i said do you consider the united states as liberators or invaders now that time has passed and the people said something interesting when they first came we treated them as liberators in time and they described how it had happened just like that overnight walls between streets in a city and then these divisions and confusions and battles and struggle to just get water and common men fighting just to have food or water and then they realized they had been played and then they said now we consider them invaders but it took time too late but if you play the media carefully the country you invade will open you with welcome arms your own countrymen will support the invasion and everyone else in the world will say ah yes applaud here's the global policeman that has said something right and then the media goes silent does not give you the negative news you've just been played royally it's so obvious so childish and yet so effective but this is just the tip of the game it was possible because a newspaper was controlled by one person the editor who controlled the headlines and often if you ask the journalist they don't know much they may write anything you can swing the article with the headline and a few edits of a few words so let's say this is part of the game the way it works let's say you want to spoil the name of somebody a leader a public influencer media person um politician or um film actor let's say so influential people the interviewer asks a question and the question is planted because just the day before the interview some extreme newspaper which is also controlled puts up a weird story accusing that person of let's say some um, theft or some misdeed misbehavior with women let's say which is one of the things which moves emotionally at least it moves the women more easily so let's say the person is accused of some sexual misconduct in the interview the journalist asks you have been accused of this do you accept do you apologize to the public or to that woman and the person says no i did not commit it this is false it is entirely made up now here as a news report with a journalist will put whatever we asked him and he said this is false entirely made up by itself if you read it you might say yes perhaps he is right but the editor plays the title the editor puts uh so and so politician denies sexual misconduct charges and avoids further discussion now in the way it is stated you are biased already oh there must be something to it and then a few words and a few slants that's enough to have tarnished the person's reputation you will see how this has been played with all global leaders who have not conformed to the globalist agenda we'll come to this shortly but this is just just to show you how powerful the media propaganda can be and it's more powerful than even the government what's the next powerful interest what moves people most easily finance financial interests who controls finance eventually if you follow the chain you come to banks every time you want to start some project you say i need the money i don't have the money otherwise i would have done so much if you go to a bank and say i have this wonderful idea can you give me money against what give us property give us some collateral so you either have to have a rich person who gives you the money because they trust you or you have to have some form of collateral maybe land property that you get in terms in return for the loan and it's only recently that we have the startup funding etc seed capitals angel funding and so on but even there the person who invests now has a say so if you control the people who give the money you can basically slant anything and we will see how this works i'll come to this later perhaps but just to give you a teaser about it it's not just about industries that are controlled by bank it's even thought which is controlled by funds look at a career scientist today what makes you uh, what makes you go up the chain of the ladder in a career of science when you publish more papers typically 
you make some breakthrough or not is not so important. You've published so many papers. This scientist has published five papers. That one has done 50 papers in the normal thinking. Oh, this one is more developed, more capable. There are very few scientists who say, I'll publish five, but they will be breakthrough papers. Then most are not capable of that. So they go with numbers. And so how do you publish a paper? You need to do some work, some research. Where do you get the funding for that? So you apply for a grant to do a research and the committee that gives you the grant money is now the control center. They literally decide which direction the science goes. If they decide what you're doing is not in our interest, they just don't give you the money. Sometimes they put conditions for the grant. If you do it this way, you have to buy all the equipment from such and such a company or such and such a country. So when typically you have these statements coming from uh, first world countries saying that we gave a grant of so much money for the spread of education in a poor country. They're always riders. They'll say all your equipment or your curriculum should be tied to such and such a company or their textbooks or what we demand from it. There's an interest there. So even in science, the funding agency will decide which direction the science exploration goes. And if there's a direction they don't want you to go, they just don't give you the funds. And in case someone does it, in spite of them, you cannot publish because it is the same group that controls which papers get published. If you manage to get published privately or otherwise, then they will create a whole group of uh, people who will try to replicate the experiment and say declare it as failed. You must have heard recently there was some hullabaloo about a South Korean scientist who claimed to have made room temperature, room temperature superconductors. He demonstrated an object floating with a room temperature superconductor. Today we are told it was all fake. Although the video is right, the experiment is valid, but it's not room temperature superconductor. Why? Rewind two years ago. In India, in the Indian Institute of Science, Two scientists published a paper declaring they had discovered room temperature superconductivity locally, little patches in some material. A similar violent reaction, opposition and buried. IIT Madras developed batteries based on iron, not lithium. Very cheap, almost as effective and nothing after that. So this is to show that if you control the money, you can pretty much control everything eventually. You can control cinema. Let's say you fund a cinema and the cinema may be patriotic, but the funding agency will insert a particular requirement. So as you know, bulk of Bollywood is controlled by Dawood Ibrahim. And this has been going back a, couple, a few decades. And so from the point that control came in, the whole thing swung into a very anti-national or even anti-Hindu, anti-Indian slant. And the language became extremely mixed. Hindi was pushed out, replaced by Urdu. And every image, every song, even when there was a Hindu religious song, had allied to it something which was deprecating. This pattern is so clear. All of the movies will tend to make you want to dislike yourself or your culture or your roots or your past. Because the funding agent controls the content. So there's a song, I don't remember now, this was a very patriotic movie and it, there was a song which went Ye Mera India and there is a picture of Sri Krishna and Bansuri Wala, the one with the uh, flute and as the song goes Bansuri Wala, the image moves to a mosque and there's a sound of Ya Allah and the two merge. Now, it's fine, it's not a problem, but you would never see the reverse. You never see Bansuri Wala coming with a movie that has to do with uh, a mosque. And this, interestingly, was promoted in all the tapes. It was edited out in certain images, in certain videos, in certain areas. So you saw in it a clear agenda for an objective, whatever the objective is. But the power of the money is your second power. This again can buy out politicians. Look at what happens in the US elections. And you're seeing this happening in real time now. Fascinating to watch that everybody who's standing for elections now has to raise money based on 
the response of people. So the people who will give you the money now will control you. You don't have the money yourself. There was only there were only two U.S. presidents who came who did not need money from others. One was Ross Perot in the 1992 or something. I don't remember the exact year. Somewhere in that period, Ross Perot had already enough money. He didn't need to borrow from anybody. And so all his agendas were revolutionary. He would question everything. And there was a potential there. And then suddenly he withdrew. Nobody knows why. Obviously he was threatened, blackmailed in some way. And the second we saw was Trump. Trump came without depending on anything for the funds. He could do exactly what he wanted, see exactly what he wanted, not beholden to anyone. And even if the media went against him, he had the means to counter them with his own ability to reach out his message. These were the only two in the US history that we see, at least in recent times. Uh, in most other countries, you will find inevitably, if you have to have a long campaign, you need to raise money and then you're dependent on those who give the money. Nobody gives money just like that. They need their return. So typically it will be that after having given money, you say, well, can you give us this now that you're in power? Help us with that. Push through this clearance faster and so on. So the money interest, where does it come from? Think about it. Who has the most money? It's not even the businessmen. It's the banks. Because the way the banks work, they can lend out 10 times more than they have. Let's say you have an actual sum of 100 rupees, but that's not money either. But let's say you have that 100 rupees. You're allowed by the law to lend 100 rupees 10 times. You have only 100, but you can lend to 10 people the same 100. And how do you do that? You just put a number in their account. But they have to pay back the interest, whatever that interest. Let's uh, just say for the purpose of calculation, it's a 10% interest. When everybody pays back the 10% interest, you have just made 100 rupees over your 100 doing absolutely nothing just by putting a number on their accounts. So the people are slaving out to give you back interest for something which you never had. You lent out a thousand rupees having only a hundred and earned a 10% interest on the thousand, which was notional only. So effectively you started with X amount, you just doubled it in one year. And the next year now you can lend 200 and you double that the next year. This is the power of a bank. Who decides this? Now here's the interesting part. Who gave the bank this power? Eventually it goes back to uh, an alliance of politicians who make the policies and the bankers. And once you have this alliance now, it's possible for them to create a mutually beneficial framework. But you'll say somebody will reveal it, somebody will speak out and people will get angry. That's where you have to make the third leg of the power structure, which is the media. To ensure the media is lulling you and never revealing this, or if it is revealed, they dismiss it. Ah, oh, yes, of course, what's wrong? That's normal. Everyone does it. Why are you making a big fuss? And divert your attention to something which is totally irrelevant. So the moment you have got these three, money, power, media, the three together make for the most effective control. That's not the end of it, because now you can extend a little further from the government interest, which is def defining policies. You have to get into the judiciary because the judiciary can question the government if it goes against the framework of the constitution or the law. Now, if you own the judge, then this will not happen. The politician will go scot-free. You see that recently um, pretty much everywhere in the world right now. <laughs> and then you have the industry interests, educational interests, which is long-term, religious interests, and military interests. To the extent that in a modern country, the military is subjugated by the elected representatives. The military still has a power, but not so much. But if you look at a country like Pakistan, where the military is the government, then you can see how it forms this un unhealthy alliance. 
the military literally decides who will be the president or prime minister they can knock you out they can put you in jail they can release you the judges are owned by them everything is owned by them so that's not a healthy framework but you see how it always moves towards the unhealthy, unhealthy framework by this accumulation of interests now having listed all these and the religious interest is another interesting one because the religious interest is was at least in the past almost as powerful as the king look at europe the church and the king were equal in power at during a certain period so the church representative could actually dismiss a king if required because people believed in the church more than in the king the church then gave authority to the king so they had reversed values until some countries broke away and their by started a whole new chain of values but at that point the church controlled the king and a lot of intrigues around these things but what is special about the religion because it promised at least during the time when it was strong it promised you something which had supposedly eternal value it gave you the power to buy the ticket to heaven so if you gave so much money to the church you would go to heaven literally they sold tickets like that if you slaved your whole life for the church then you would be assured a place in heaven and the other side was the fear you would be saved from the hell so this reward punishment mind control the most sophisticated form of control was through the religions now this is not to say that the religions did not have a deeper component yes they did some did some didn't or there were periods when they had more mystical content or more uh, manipulative political content and you have these variations all the time but the power it gave to those who controlled the church was the power of the minds of people and so during that period you had uh, religions which were more powerful than that was the equivalent of the media power today but today that is much reduced and so i've named so many interest groups and this pretty much covers bulk of the interests power interests what is missed out where is the humanity interest who stands for protecting the need of humanity or human beings generally nobody each of these power interests have their own interest first when they combine together then they don't care what you do so there's a relationship of those who are powerful against those who are not powerful or unable to become powerful or unable to participate in the power structure it creates this separation of a hierarchy of power and then naturally it creates intermediates uh, this is very important to understand because this is inevitable you go to any planet any history of any time period of anywhere in the universe this will tend to happen because we have a physical body vital body and mental body so these are almost universal inevitable principles this happens and gradually a hierarchy forms because the powerful need intermediates to rule the powerless and so they build they cultivate this intermediate layer there is a description by the british rulers in india i do not remember any more the name of the author where he says that we need to build coconuts that is brown skin outside uh, white mind inside <laughs> so the coconuts were the ones who felt themselves british but were indian in appearance but thought like the british looked up to them as demigods or rulers be were happily deliberately servile because they believed it that's the power of the programming they would turn to the rest of the indians and feel themselves repeat what the british did or talk to talk down to the others and so there was this hierarchy which was deliberately built up for which you have to enter into educational interests what did the british do they cut off all the traditional schools india had some of the most advanced schools they had universities equivalent in practically every uh, kingdom 300 kingdoms so you can imagine the numbers involved the common man in india was more educated than uh, the common man in europe all this was stopped first and then replaced by the british system selectively to form an elite 
Nehru, when he completed, when he uh, became the first prime minister, and you must understand, he did not, he was not really elected. He was selected by Gandhi. So when he becomes the first prime minister, in an interview with Kenneth Galbraith, which Kenneth Galbraith then documents in his memoirs, he said, as they were talking, Nehru leaned over to me in a conspiratorial whisper and said, you know, I am the last Englishman to rule India. He considered himself an Englishman. He considered his role as ruling. Who? Those inferior masses. He was an elite inferior masses. And there are stories that he sent his uh, uh, dress for dry cleaning all the way to Paris and things like that. Uh, some deny it, some say it is true. doesn't matter, but that was the mentality. They created effectively this intermediate layer. So all th this happens everywhere. It's not just in India. I'm just giving these examples because these are more accessible. So among all these, who looks after the common man interests of humanity? Nobody. One of the great secrets of power and control of the masses is that the actual power is in the hands of the masses. You, us, common men, people, we have the power. We give it to them who rule us. We look up to them and say, tell us what to do. They didn't take the power. You gave it to them. How did you give it? Well, that's the play. That's their skill. When there's a crisis, the skillful power monger comes and says, I will solve it for you. But I need from you this sacrifice. You must all do this. And I will solve the problem for you. And you say yes, willingly. Because you're desperate. So you'll notice, whenever there is a political crisis and somebody who is in power finds himself in distress, having lost the faith of the people, one of the easiest things they can do is start a war. And suddenly the common man says, ah yes, we back you. Because it's you are saving us. Sri Aurobindo refers to this in the ideal of human unity and he points out how wars have always been the means by which the collective ego of a nation has been consolidated. Except that once you know this works like this, you can create fake wars. There is a movie called Wag the Dog which describes this. You create a fake crisis, create a war and then keep people busy with that and you become at that time the wartime hero leader. Easy games to play. But you will say, why would they do that? There's so much misery, so much struggle, so much loss. I think it was George Bush, George H.W. Bush, the second one, who um, is recorded as having said to, I think it was the president of Brazil, one of the South American countries, he said, you know, war is the most profitable business. And he was actually asking help from that president to join him in a certain strategy to create a war and so earn money. And it's a fact. So the elite there have been so disconnected from the suffering of the masses that they don't care or some of them revel in it. So there's a perversion involved up the chain. So we'll come to this also as we go along. But this is to show you how power interests accumulate and there is nobody to stand for the humanity interest except you and I. But we gave away the power to them, isn't it? How do we take it back? What do you do? You look for somebody who will lead us. And then what happens? Well, you don't find someone. Or if you find someone, that person is easily co-opted and bought out by the power system. It's easy to do that. Sometimes they're threatened, they're blackmailed, or they're simply paid enough money and they vanish. We had in Tamil Nadu, a couple of years ago during the elections, Rajni Kant who stood up. I'm naming him because he is the first political leader in Tamil Nadu who came with an open spiritual agenda. He is a follower of Paramahans Yogananda who had regular practice of meditation. He spoke about it. He openly described the need for a spiritual awakening and so on. He stood for elections and then suddenly stepped out. Why? What happened? I was told this and uh, I have to be careful how I word it. He had a 
sib a, a child who was living in a different country and the person was attacked there in that country and threatened and it was very simple he knew that he got the message if he continued if he shook the existing power structures well his family would pay the price that was it he just withdrew something similar would have happened with ross peru we see what happens when leaders do not conform you can see how they are accused in all different ways but this is what happens when somebody controls the whole media and the judiciary and so on they can create any difficulty for you so who stands for human interest nobody except you and i a major awakening is needed where people can together say this and nothing else and the day we can do that that is we are sufficiently awakened and know what we want that leadership has to do what you ask but if the media has sufficiently confused you then you are divided there's a group that says we want this another group says we want that and you keep fighting each other and they want you fighting so that they don't turn against that you don't turn against them they don't want you fighting in two blocks they want you fighting in a thousand blocks so they will divide in as many ways as you can so this is first point nobody stands for human interest except us humanity's interest except us second point who stands for the ecological interest for the earth's interest nobody not even us because at the end of the day we stand for ourselves i give an example all of us know that plastic is bad that plastic is destroying the environment plastic is a hormone mimic it's going into the water one of the worst ways in which the plastic is going into water is these uh, micro plastics which are very fine uh, balls of plastic which are put in face cream and face scrub and various uh, beauty lotions we know this have you made any change in how you use these products have you made any effort to stop using plastic or reduce its use or reuse so that you do not waste more and maybe even a guilty look you might say yes sometimes but how much as long as you buy and throw plastic you have ensured the industry continues and as long as the industry continues the politicians and the power structures and the banks and the media and everyone in cahoots will ensure they have their profit isn't it it's very simple the day we decide the entire machinery up there has to change but we can't decide because they programmed us and they play us with the media controls so ecological earth's interests we are too busy surviving and one of the easiest ways to ensure that we remain slaves is to ensure we do not have enough to live that we are always cramming that you are always working hard that you don't have enough time to sleep you don't have time to, enough to read you don't have time to think you don't have time to be happily relaxed rewind 50 years ago you could do that i've mentioned this in some earlier talks 50 years ago a family of five people could be run by one person working full time so typically it was the father who would work the mother would look after family the children would be going to school and come back home to somebody some parent who is in the family or some grandparents would be there also and you had a family of five six sometimes more pe more people one person working was enough today with both parents working it's never enough what has changed so some of it has to do with the lifestyle we are taught that we need that expensive car do you really need that one which is 10 times the price yes it has greater luxuries it uh, sends a message that i have arrived at some level of social standing that's the illusion the media gave you through the advertising actually for your functional use you don't need that you can do something which much something much simpler isn't it so if you start thinking again and review the values you can actually reduce the wastage and then you can find you can live with much less but then comes the insecurity but what happens after 20 years again uncertainty created for the future again going back 50 years you could say i have saved and 50 years down i will have this money today you can't because 50 years down you don't know if the bank will survive and if the bank survives the inflation will eliminate the value of whatever you have so all this is deliberately created and remember 
there's a mentality that looks ahead a thousand years and plans this. Now all this is to point out just how interests work. And that in the short term when these interests combine, I, will, I refer to it as the deep state, because they ensure while the politicians change, new politicians are elected, the bureaucracy is exactly the same. The same people decide and implement the policies irrespective of who the politicians are. And they can compromise a politician's policy and ensure it is ineffective. Politician can come on the plank of uh, honesty and transparency and it can be completely ruined by the people who have to execute it. And if nothing else, you have the other, the judiciary and the police and others who will come in cahoots with the media suppressing or uh, deliberately distracting people. Behind that are the institutions which are much bigger, which I have referred to earlier as the cabal. These often are generational families who control the banks, who control the, um, the politics sometimes, sometimes they are royal families, businesses, and where they have interests that go across several generations. And behind that is the one world government agenda which is not tied anymore to individuals, it's not even tied to families, it's formed a group of interests all under deliberate, conscious, uh, larger powers. You will say, I'll use the word occult powers. When this kind of an organization takes place, it's very difficult to bring forward the human needs or the underlying truth. How did this come about? Because while initially they were fragmented kingdoms, as the unification of the world takes place in time with increasing communications and with the technological uh, bridges forming, even as humanity would naturally evolve into, let's say, a larger friendship and family, these entities which have interests come in and step in and use the same vehicles, the same means to divide humanity and control them on a larger scale. The same mechanism used to control the masses in a kingdom is now extended to the whole internet and to all of humanity. Except now you have multiple interests which collide. So when they collide, what do you do? They don't want to fight each other. They know what that means. It means they will all get exposed and they'll get destroyed. So they come together in an agreement. You will find these international bodies in many different ways across the world. And they inevitably co-opt the new entrants into their exclusive club of power structure. So there is a famous something called Club of Rome, there is a famous uh, committee of 300 which often has these royal families which are part of the group. There is another one which is called the, um, there is the World Economic Forum recently which invites people. They very clearly de declare their goal. We get the young leaders influence them, bring them into our ambit and if they are aligned to our thought process, we ensure they get the funding and the support to get into positions of power to execute our agenda. They say it openly and the head of the WEF even recently announced that they, were, they have been most successful in Canada. The entire Canadian um, legislative is in their control and other countries are very much uh, aligned in the way they can control them. There are others. There is, there is the Bohemian Grove, which is a meeting of world leaders and influencers. Powerful people are invited and there is an agenda that takes place. They don't reveal to the public what they are discussing. Why? What have they to hide? Precisely because they look down upon the public as people to be controlled. They set the agendas of what they plan to do for the next, let's say, decade which industries they will promote, which they will suppress, what direction they will take. And when they come back, the the group itself and all these groups, it's not just this one, consist of media, politicians, banks, military, uh, industry interests, religious interests, everything together. All the names we took just now, they're all together in this and they ensure the most powerful people are either brought in or removed. Now, the problem with speaking about these things openly is there is a whole propaganda machinery to label you straight away as conspiracy theorist or something denier or anti-something or some fringe thinkers etc. And that's part of the media control to ensure that 
nobody can openly talk about these things so this is one of the reasons why i avoid speaking about it but i'm putting it in a context which is very different in a spiritual context that there are actually powers which build this going across millennia and as the world has been unifying externally these powers have been unifying the domain of their control through such means and how do they ensure that they stay in power that this unification is not broken because it's human nature the moment you bring many people with common interests to, to with opposing interests to come together because they all want their territory to expand and they will collide they will eventually fight and well expose each other or destroy each other what they do is they come together and there is a seal which is placed anybody who breaks these rules of agreement is immediately eliminated so they make you a promise you can be part of the club but if you break the rules of the club we eliminate you and they often have some rituals for that also and you will see many deaths have taken place with very unusual kinds of death go back to the year uh, 2019 2020 you will find a large number of publicly known figures all famous tv personalities or politicians committed suicide by hanging themselves with a red colored uh, tie from a door knob one of the most famous ones was a tv personality who was the world's famous world famous french chef committed suicide by hanging himself by a tie a red colored tie from a door knob how do you hang yourself from a door knob and the media said that and no investigation the whole thing was hushed up but he was not one in that same year there were about five who did that why because they decided that they did not want to play this game and they were about to expose it and they were knocked out so this is higher levels of power is a very dangerous game i'll give you a few examples of uh, videos that you can watch of people who have been part of that game and have come out and spoken of course within limitations uh, but now you have to look at it from this way once you have this let's say integrated global level control system and this is spanning across countries across power structures how do you ensure it survives because the agenda is still long term it's a thousand year rule you see nazism openly declared this that they were going to rule the world for a thousand years they would create an empire of a thousand years interestingly shyorobindo also said the same thing if nazism succeeds then it will set back earth's evolution by a thousand years but the mentality has not gone that form of it was defeated the mentality continues the same group the same thinker the same value system forces possess others so how do they ensure that they have their thousand year rule by taking control of the next generation that forms and here it comes to something very interesting they have to look ahead look at who are the young unifiers decision makers influencers power mongers upcoming religious heads potential leaders etc reach out to them while they are young and own them early on in a way that they can never escape how do you do that If you had to do this what would you do let's say you had access to the bank's funding that means you can get any amount of money you have access, you have control of media you can spread anything you want any story and you have uh, the necessary reach to ask anybody for any favor what would you do if you had to plan long term so what they do is they go to the elite schools inevitably anybody who is wealthy or has enough capacity to get a scholarship will end up with the best which is often the more expensive schools infiltrate the schools now you don't have to control the school of course if you can control their educational content all the better which you can see also happening in many of the ivy league universities across the world but you don't need to control them all you need to do is have an access point inside by which you can interact with that group Now I'll show you how this works in the US particularly and then you can see how it extends in the other places. Each of these Ivy League universities or colleges they all have something called fraternities. I found it very strange when looking at United States movies Hollywood movies 
they would show you entire buildings dedicated to have clubs and children struggling to join a club to get prestige and the movie shows you this as a way of programming you to want it and the privileges they get by being part of the club but in order to join the club they have to do some the, some of the most demeaning and perverse acts to become worthy of joining it and this is normalized through cinema so that when you go to that space and you are asked to do something demeaning you say ah yes i saw that in the movie i know i have to do that and after that i will get rewarded you've been programmed but what's the point of these very early on while you're still young that's when you can be brash you can make stupid mistakes and if you're made to ask to do a challenge and one of the things they will do to get into an elite club is break a law commit a crime innocent seemingly fun but having done that you are now part of the club to go to the next level for higher privileges you have to commit a slightly greater crime what is interesting is in the us media these things are suppressed when they find that certain crimes are committed by fraternity challenges people are killed and this happened recently and the police said this was most likely a fraternity challenge a group of young people were, were, was killed by others who came in the middle of the night and murdered them except they murdered the wrong person and it was all linked to a fraternity challenge to this day nobody has been arrested because you have to understand the fraternities themselves go back a few generations and the people controlling the university were part of the fraternity once and again this is shown to you in the hollywood movie that the person the father tells the child ah, i was part of this fraternity or the head of the institution the president of the university says ah yes i was part of the community of this fraternity and i've been through all that whatever you're going through so you are uh, forgiven and it, so in this way you reach out to three things rich people control them while they're young intelligent people with very high iq who will be influencers in some way charismatic people and famous people now these are all centers of power potentially for the future it doesn't matter if they make it the point is if they make it you have them in control you get them to start doing things which are illegal and then a little more crude a little more coarse a little more perverse each time a little more degrading until at some point they have lost the sensitivity of the psychic influence and it's done in steps and each time you're rewarded the entire structure is a kind of a program it's a mind control programming where you're sucked into something where you cannot come out now i have had i've heard these stories from actual people one friend of mine for example went through such a thing i won't give specifics of the location so that his privacy is maintained um he was in a university in a country we won't say which and he was invited to this he knew there was such and such a fraternity he was invited he said no i'm not interested he kept repeating and one of his best friends insisted just come once so he's taken in he says okay just for you i go once they put him on a chair the whole fraternity surrounded him they were wearing all kinds of uh, ritualistic clothes and they tied his hands made him drink alcohol and harassed him with questions abuses and questions and at the end of this when he was forced through the night 10 hours or something and then he was thrown in the room and locked up humiliated to the extreme in a state of utter drunkenness made to reveal speak out secrets or things which he is ashamed of and things like that in a state of drunkenness and then the door is opened eventually all this is typical um, methods used in a concentration camp to break a person psychologically to make them speak exact same methods it's a mind control technology and then his friend comes out and says i am so very sorry now that you have come out of the drunken state i am so very sorry that's it that was the initiation ceremony now you are a brother everyone will be with you will get all the benefits he finds that every single person in the university who was super smart or super rich was part of this club and so he got to know this once he was in it and then he found the benefits so you need this much money no problem call up x so the club member tells him call up x x is somebody in the city town hall you call him up and say you're a member of this club he calls him up and the guy says yes i was a member of course how much money do you need 20000 whatever it is 
twenty thousand, no problem, you have it. And the next day he had the money. The access it gave him, literally the entire machinery of the city was in his access. He could do anything, he could get the funds, he could get the marks, he could get all the benefits, literally like a king. Why would anyone bother to leave that? Think about it. See, the play is on the attraction of your desires and your conscience. This man fortunately said after all this he saw, he was surprised, he was stunned and then he says, but it's demeaning. I find it crude, coarse and they would all be into parties with uh, orgies and drugs and alcohol and things. It is demeaning. I don't want this. I've come here to study. I don't want it. And he withdrew. He stopped going. They got very upset. And what happens? From the day he stops going, all of them, all of the club members stopped looking at him, stopped talking to him, would behave as if he didn't exist. If he walked by and spoke to them, they would pretend as if he was invisible. Suddenly he was friendless in the whole university. You see the extreme. Everything or nothing. Had he gone further up the chain, if you break a law, then you are even you can be killed. But this is at a very low level, so that doesn't apply. But you are completely ostracized. He chose that. Eventually, his friend came and begged him. He said, "Just come once more, and we will just we will let you go. But we just want to see you once." And under great pressure, he goes back. This time, it is put through a ceremony of expulsion, which was a sexual ceremony, as if he is thrown out sexually. Very strange. So the whole structure there was an occult structure built up of a low grade vital energy with an entity feeding on the whole thing. And that was the basis of this fraternity of an elite university of that country. And this is one example everywhere. If you look back at the US presidents, all of them going back some 50 years, have been part of a club called the Skull and Bones Society. All of them, including Obama, except Trump, except Ronald Reagan. I don't know of any others. All the others have been part of the Skull and Bones Society. And this is documented. It's not a big deal. You can look it up. It's a list. And they proudly say, ah, yes, see, our people become presidents. No, it's the other way. The controlled people are allowed to stand for being president, those who are not controlled are eliminated by the media well before they can get to any level of power. So, catch them young, pervert them, blackmail them, reward their desires, give them all power or complete um, elimination of uh, uh, social ostracization and cut off access to funds. Is uh, was there an interruption in the video? I saw this. Okay. And if you go further up the chain, death if you disobey. Now, this is the mechanism which is entrenched. It is very well organized and it is globally organized. In India, it's not like this. It's slightly different. Uh, in the West, this whole system of secret societies and clubs goes back a few centuries. So, it's part of the culture. In India, we have never had secret societies in this sense, but we have had families and then loyalties to families and the structure is put a little differently. So if you go into the power structures of the states or the center in India, what you find is every single bureaucrat is aligned to one family or one politician or some particular interest, sometimes a business interest. Everybody is owned. And if somebody is there who is not owned, he never gets the funds, he never gets the support, he never gets the protection, is always criticized and attacked. Until he aligns. So somebody comes to him and says, look, you have this trouble, we will solve it, but you have to pledge loyalty to our, whatever, company or political family or otherwise. And everybody knows who belongs to whom. And they will never conflict with each other. But they have between themselves a kind of a struggle, a battle. We put more of our people, you try to put more of your people, but we never expose each other. So there's this honor among thieves kind of structure. It's not as organized in the West, but the same power structure, the same kind of framework tends to inevitably come. Once you've reached this stage, and what I'm showing again is pure, common, instinctive power mongering. It'll be the same everywhere. 
in the universe. Once this is reasonably in place, the machinery, the system ensures that only those who are controlled are promoted up the power structure. If you cross a certain point, either you are owned or you are removed. Very simple to create a fake accusation. And then you give them the necessary funds. So I want to give you a few examples of how this works very quickly because we have pretty much closed, for, completed for today uh, in terms of time. When India was creating ISRO, uh, which is the Indian Space Research Organization, was creating the rocket engines for liquid fuel, which is one of the most complex and advanced technologies. And India had it. They were building it. The chief scientist who was doing this work, Nambi Narayanan, was suddenly caught in some fake accusation by a policeman who completely faked the accusation. The media played it, which was also controlled. They were fed money. And this man was thrown into disrepute. I think it took about 10 or 15 more years for the courts to finally clear, clear him and say, oh, he was totally innocent, nothing was wrong. By then he had been removed, the entire uh, program had been sidetracked. India was forced to buy liquid fuel engines from Russia and nobody else would sell and it was a crisis. It delayed the program by at least 15 years. But this brilliant scientist was thrown out, finally proved to, to be uh, innocent. Do you think he could not have been found to be innocent earlier? But the policeman who did this then went on to go to Gujarat and there he created fake cases against the then chief minister. So the same chain, he was a controlled person who was used to create the mischief. Of course, they are rarely used on a major scale multiple times, but I am giving this as an example of how it can work. And it does not matter if they succeed or not. The fact that the person is removed from the system or thrown into disrepute, their work is done. And it's not always individuals who do it because they have something against you. It's also the forces who control the individuals who do it. Anytime somebody grows and becomes a focal point of light, suddenly you'll find all kinds of strange accusations put against them and their reputation ruined. And it can happen just pure gossip mongering. And so I would even put this as a warning. The moment you find somebody who's doing good, with a lot of nasty stories around them, be sure this is a game of forces. And don't believe all the stories you hear. I'll give you another example. This was told to me by one of these uh, Syrian youth. This was again in a youth meeting. And we were talking about how these influences work. And this person said, ah yes, this is what happened to us. And he narrated this. It was at that time, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago when the there was a crisis in Syria and one of the leaders was overthrown who was actually heading for, he wanted to organize elections and there was what they call this color uprisings, you know, they have green revolution, red revolution, pink revolution, which are all orchestrated and there was this uprising and he was overthrown by somebody who was controlled and replaced by someone who was controlled. So this fellow was one of the young persons in the university. And he told us, initially, we did a demonstration and it was spontaneous. We all came together and that was it. Among these young students, there was one person who had a natural leadership potential. He was a friend of this man. And that, man, that leader said, after the first demonstration they did, he got a phone call. It was an American sounding voice. And the voice accent, you know, it can be faked, but it so happened to be an American sounding voice. And he said, we have just put so many thousand dollars in your bank account. We like very much the work which, which you are doing. Every time you do a demonstration like this, you will have more money. And then he hung up. That's it. No way to trace this. And his bank account has the money. Now, if this man is greedy, he will say, all right, I'm going to organize some more and some more and some more. And every time there will be a phone call which will nudge him one step here, one step there. And that's it. You have a puppet doing your work. It can never be traced back. But this was actually told to me by one of these young people. And then he said, they had a second demonstration and the second time something strange happened. They were all students. They were asking for democracy. And then a group of people came who were dressed differently who were not students. They had guns and they started shooting at the police. And the police shot back. 
and that created the crisis which became the headlines the next day which was blamed on the president and started the color revolution fascinating it's so simple actually it's so easy to manipulate all you need is the support of the media and a little bit of money and if you have access to the person's bank account you can do things I'll give you another example there's an upcoming movie soon to which has just been launched today or yesterday in india and there are controversies about the slant of the movie there's one public influencer on twitter uh, x now sakshi arora who just posted a post couple of days ago saying that i think it's a she got a message from one of the promoters of the movie saying that if you delete your negative tweet and post a positive tweet we will pay you so much money per positive tweet and then many others came out saying we also received similar messages you see how it can be done so simply the entire media can be orchestrated you do not need to know people directly you just need to have people who are willing to sell themselves you one more example this is again someone in the us uh, political circle he was not into politics he said i'll never go into politics but he was an influential person he was going through difficulties and then suddenly he's had approached by one of these uh, let's call it uh, as they say it in the media it's a foundation uh, charitable foundation and he was told oh if you work for us we can give you money you don't have to do much you just have to write a report once in a while he says okay he needed money they gave him money and a few months down he had not written the report they said don't worry we will continue to give you the money and the money kept coming and it came from one of these people one of these foundations whose owner has declared that he is going to work for regime change in india to replace modi same same structure and he was it, this was told to me by the person directly so what i'm pointing out here is the power structures are well organized they've created this wall to ensure that anywhere there is a little flicker of light coming they will act rapidly to extinguish and everywhere else they will organize the bricks i will say the individuals they come up the chain of hierarchy and fit into this clear structure of wall that is blocking the evolutionary uprising and the descent of the light and putting it in an image in vertical terms as human consciousness rises power centers influential people influential structures systems lineages are subverted if they are open and put in place to block higher progress so that anybody with good intention can never rise beyond a point there is a glass ceiling you bump you don't know why you can't go up further and you see all others who are less capable than you going up the chain and you don't understand why well because they accepted to compromise and the compromised and controlled are rapidly going up the chain and they block the further further revolution and from there the control they impose and create this separation of the controllers and the controlled and this is the intermediate and sometimes layers of these intermediate organizations to the actual controllers up there suppressing or bringing down darkness into the masses blocking off from the light which wants to descend or preventing the masses from awakening it's very well organized most of the interests are concentrated around families lineages political parties nowadays sometimes financial blocks but they all have a thought process longer than a human career span and if you don't understand this you will not understand how this works and the perversion has gone down many generations so that the children of those families or the controllers in their lineages have become sociopaths they are not normal human beings they don't feel like us they have disconnected from the psychic influence they are made to go through certain kinds of rituals and all this is still happening by pure power structure interests and i have not touched upon what happens when they open consciously to asuric influences or to occult things occult means when that happens then their power is enormously amplified and the darkness now completely seizes this organized wall and makes it impenetrable so this is where we are and this is the condition in humanity today if it was left to this we would say there's no hope fortunately it's not left to this and i will con 
close with a few observations. Llewellyn made this observation from his experience of the wall. He said from the side of the light, the light could easily dissolve the wall if it wanted. But it is the human beings who constructed it. And you will recall the mother's observation which we just read, where she says that if only human beings would condescend to invoke the light. And it is actually as simple as that. But we have been so brainwashed by the sense of the familiarity with the darkness and the loss of memory of the light which is our home, which is ourselves, our true nature, that we don't even remember or having touched it momentarily we say, ah this is so nice and ploop you go back to your sleepy state, sleep walking state and I've seen this in so many people. Especially for example here in the ashram people come sometimes, they come and they go to a sacred space and they say, oh we were so moved, it was so beautiful, this is such a wonderful and then in a few minutes or hours, they have gone back to their normal way of being and the whole thing has faded out. The human nature has been so clouded, darkened. They are open, momentarily it comes and then it closes and the other interests come, covers it up. So I am going to close with this for today. We will have a few more discussions coming in the next few uh, days. So, I would recommend for those who are interested to look up Ronald Bernard. He is a Dutch banker who was part of this cabal system and he was going up the chain at some point he refused to go further and he was severely tortured. But he has spoken about what it was and what is the mentality and how the banking system is controlled, how the global control is centered around the BIS which is the Bank of International Settlement based in Switzerland and the People who work for the BIS by law can never be accused of any crime. It is fascinating how this works. They have ensured that the Swiss law makes it that if you are employed by the BIS, you can commit a crime and they cannot do, touch you. Isn't that strange? Why would you do that? Well, because of this, <laughs> to protect the system. And he explains all this and this is quite fascinating and it is all verifiable <coughs> to a great extent. Ronald Bernard. Dutch banker and you will find the videos on YouTube. There, As far as I remember there were five videos and then some new ones where he has spoken about the kinds of people and the way they think and the sociopathic nature of these. So here I took this occasion today in continuation of last time to explain how this structure forms, how in some ways it is inevitable in the very nature of human greed, desire, animal nature, power, organization but enormously amplified by these asuric powers, anti-divine, anti-evolutionary powers who then seize upon and align to the human interests to make this and makes for this condition which is like a solid block, preventing evolution or snuffing out centers of light. And so this is where we are. Had it been only this, there would be no hope but as I said, from the other side, the light can dissolve the wall any moment. It can cut a hole, it can create a crack, but what our response is will determine whether this will last. If we do nothing, the organized forces will quickly cover and block, seal the crack. And we will say, ah, oh, there was a light, oh, it went away. But if we call with sincerity, we give ourselves with sincerity, and when that acts and there is a glimmer of light and we open to it and receive it, it creates a continuity of consciousness from us through to that which then cannot be easily blocked by these forces. That is where we can make a difference. And the benefit for us is direct because when we open and we receive the touch of the light, we feel the joy that it brings us, the fullness, the deep thirst that is quenched. But we have then to cling to it and not go back, ah yes it felt so nice, now I go back to being what I was. And that's why it's so important that you organize your personality, organize your nature, organize your priorities around your soul values and your soul aspiration. This is the one thing which can recognize that, which can cling to that, which can invoke that and never be covered if you so choose. So what can we do? And I'm 
Uh, the answer is not yet complete. We will still have a few more discussions and look at other aspects of the current affairs. But this background would make you understand the other discussions we will have. What can we do? This is the single most important thing we can do. Become conscious of your deepest aspiration. Become conscious of your soul's influence. Become conscious of the psychic within you or its influence to whatever it extent it reflects in your personality. But make a distinction. There is a reflection of the psychic in your thoughts. There is a reflection in your emotions. There is a reflection in your action, in your drives, in your impulses, in your aesthetics. It's a very interesting message that the mother gave and maybe in this context it, we can look at it in a different way. Uh, she says that it's not enough to have beautiful ideas. You have to actually translate them into action, otherwise they just remain right there. Uh, we'll look at, yes, here it is. She says, even the most beautiful thoughts will not make us progress unless we have a constant will for them to be expressed in us through nobler feelings, more exact sensations and better actions. This effort to become conscious of the deeper, and it's not just thought now, the deeper influence, but then actively unify and bring its influence in your thoughts, in your emotions, in your aesthetics, in your actions. And when something happens within you that is contrary to that, to refuse it. Or even if you can't fight it when it comes up, once it passes, you say, all right, I have learned the lesson, next time I will not allow it to reach that point. And consciously build the positive. Don't fight the negative, don't waste energy on that. Build the positive and aligning to the psychic. Innately, the psychic influence, your soul is the one thing that is true within you. And so anywhere its influence comes, it has an innate truth and an innate power of overcoming all else, which is false. When truth meets falsehood, truth will always override the false, eventually. Even if initially it can, the falsehood may cover momentarily. But within us, we have the choice that we can cling to this and then the falsehood cannot cover. Externally, it's a different game. That takes time. But internally, at least, we can have this clear center of aspiration, uncompromising. And don't worry if there are compromises in the superficial parts. Your nature is complex. There are parts which rebel. Do not worry. Hold this center. And from this center, open yourself. Invoke the light of the Divine Mother and the love of the Divine Mother and the knowledge and her force and her power. If you are in a position of power where you have to exercise power, ask for her power to flow and do what is right and show you what is right in the knowledge and give you the strength to do what is right. And as these points of light that we would so be grow through this organized rigid wall, little points, dots begin to cut through. Because there is a point of receptivity here. It is when we close that the hostiles can go and cover it up. When we remain open and there is a continuation of the link from the light to you, nothing can close it if you do not let it go, if you do not compromise. So this is where we have to start. Spend some time every day, center yourself in your deepest aspiration and from there open yourself. Choose to align the rest of the day to your center, to your aspiration. And do not worry if there are slips. Come back, correct yourself and correct yourself again and again. Organize this within you. If the wall is organized by external structures, the resolution is by an internal organization of the truth within us, which will overcome it. Keep this as your most important effort. It takes very little time, rather it's a persistence of what is true, so always easier to do. And let's work upon it together and we can concentrate on this for a while together. I read again Mother's message. This wonderful world of delight waiting at our gates for our call to come down upon earth. 
It's just there. I'll take up some of the questions which are in the chat box. Do leave them in. I'll take them up for next time. And we'll continue the topic in the next session. Namaste. Okay. Namaste.